Welcome to the Lit RPG Audiobook Podcast. I'm Ray. I'll be reviewing some recent and classic Lit RPG audiobooks for you today. Today I'm going to begin with The Slayer, Ethergate Online, Book 1, by Darren Haltberg Jr., narrated by J. Scott Bennett, with a book length of 11 hours and 42 minutes. Prologue Dusk had fallen at the Axion Research Facility, the building empty and dark as the midnight hour drew close. A cluster of monitors came to life, illuminating a small room in blue. At the center of the room stood a man, his suit well-fitted and neatly pressed, his arms crossed tightly across his chest. Images from the monitors reflected onto his glasses. Numbers scrolled haphazardly across the screen. Information to be processed... Data. Another man entered the room, his posture slumped. He wore his weariness like a cheap suit. Sir, are you sure about this? he asked. The amount of lives this will affect is going to be catastrophic. The first remained silent for a moment before answering. Do you find satisfaction in this world, Wesley? <sighs> so... For me to say that this was a bit of a wonky piece of work is an understatement. The story is really ambitious, but in a lot of ways, its grasp exceeds its reach. I know that doesn't make sense, but you'll understand here in a minute. It wants to do a lot of things, and it goes overboard because of it. I mean, game mechanics were weird, motivations for the characters themselves was off, and the characters were sort of off-putting. For example, the main character finds himself in a game only to discover it's not a game. And I'm not giving you spoilers. It comes out pretty quickly. Um, and and, and it, the game that they're in is a real game that if you die there, you die for real. The players that have been separated from their bodies mentally, but somehow the bodies remain alive, okay, as do their minds. But if you disconnect the body, which has a completely separated mind way over, way over wherever this other place is, then the body dies. Okay, so dying in a game is true death, and disconnecting from the game will cause the body to die. The players will remain alive, the mental part, but it has some severe repercussions uh, that just, it, it doesn't make sense to me. The disconnect issue just is bizarre. No one would live very long if they were forced to stay attached to the game. If you think about it, if your kid or your brother or your father or whoever is playing a game, and they suddenly drop over unconscious, they, they're they non-responsive, what's the first thing you're going to do? You're going to yank them out of their headset, right? Zoinks! That's it. That means that body's dead, and there's now problems for the brain that's stuck inside the game. Now, there's a lot of games that have that trapped-in-the-game feel, and because they're technically not in a game, it's, it's a real world, you can say that's not the case, but... There's supposed to be a tenuous connection between the mind and the body, and there has been instance, instances where somebody from the game returns to the real world. So, why would the body just drop over dead? It doesn't make sense. It's just bizarre. Um, so, I don't know. It, no one would live very long if they were forced to stay in the game. Okay, like I said, medical people would come, and, and it would just be all over with. Um, so, either they're on a new world with new bodies, or they're still in, on Earth, playing a game. It can't be both, and you're not told which it's going to be. Now, another of the problems that I had was the omniscient powers of the main character, Adam. Although he is just as much a newbie as every other player in a game, because they started out at the exact same moment that the game went live. Everybody got in and started playing at the same exact time. Okay, he was right there on the countdown. Three, two, one, boom, he's in. Okay, he didn't even read a book or a manual or anything. He just went Straight in cold. Now, I'll be honest with you, that's how I would play. I generally skip tutorials when I play games. I don't like to do it. I like to feel my way through stuff. And then when I have a problem, I ask one of my kids. <laughs> uh, and then they laugh at me. So, uh, you know, that is a t totally understandable part for me to kind of conceive of actually happening. Okay. But somehow... Adam knows rules and prohibitions that nobody else does. And it's never explained why he does this, why he knows these things and no one else does at all. Never explained. Uh, you know, and by that I mean 
there will come an, uh, a point, and I won't give any of these away. I won't give any full examples, but they'll get to a, a junction, and he'll have other players with him, and they'll say, we should go do X, Y, Z. And then Adam will say, well, we can't do X, Y, Z because none of us have that class that allows us to do the X or the Y or the Z. And they all say, oh, gee, you're right, Adam. Thank you for pointing that out. And then they go do something that's totally against their classes anyway that they shouldn't be able to do. That'd be like telling like um, some sort of uh, uh, a fighter or a warrior who's in full plate mail that he can't sneak because he's not, you know, a, a rogue or a thief. But then he, he will, you know, slide on by in another way that only a sneak or a rogue would be able to do. It's just really bizarre. I just, I don't understand what was happening there. Um, and, you know, and Adam goes by the name Xander in the game, and it's it's kind of a silly point because he, he keeps himself from another person in the school through that, that name. But either way, just there's just certain things that Adam does that no one else should should he should know it and, and either if he knows it then they should all know it too and it's just it it's just really wonky also the game mechanics fluctuate a lot okay sometimes they require energy sometimes they don't cooldowns aren't always the same midway through the book it all changed and it got reworked or it was dropped um it just felt like the book was started one way and then it changed direction and was never addressed the back stuff so it's kind of like well I, I don't really like having to do this so i'll just stop doing that and that's how it played out so it was just weird game mechanics and it, it really felt like um like Holtberg just kind of forgot that he made changes in the end or he forgot what he had done in the beginning okay another issue is the fact that you only have one life okay and yet adam and other players Continually do things to risk their resistance for no reason. Okay. Uh, I don't know about you, but if I have to decide to be safe, get a job, and maybe start a family in the new world versus going out into the wilds of an unknown alien land full of magic monsters and mazes and most likely getting killed in the first 30 hours, I'm going to become a merchant. Okay. Just <laughs> that's me being honest. I'm going to seriously settle down find a nice place to get myself padded out nice and thick, have a few drinks and meet the ladies and, and do whatever I got to do because life is better than excitement. Okay, I mean, if you think about it, would you rather swing a sword three times and have your head chopped off or hoist a beer 4,000 times before you die? Most people are going for the beer and the ones that don't, don't make it very long. So we don't worry about them anyway. There is no reason for these people to risk themselves. Yes, Adam is tempted with the possibility of going back home, but you and I both know as readers that the likelihood of that happening is about 200 to 1 odds against. Now, there were a lot of other issues, and I have to ask myself if it would have worked as a straight fantasy rather than a lit RPG book, and I still say no. Adam is really kind of boring and dumb. I mean, he just doesn't catch on to things that my five-year-old would see coming from a mile away. Honestly, the entire premise of the reborn world makes very little sense when you consider that the people who destroyed it are going to do the exact same thing over again. They haven't learned, and I don't understand what they're wanting to do or why they want to do that. And not one of the newly minted NPCs who are real people rem really remembers the events that trashed their world the first time around. They're all just operating on this new guy's in charge, and he's the boss because... And so we listen to him. Uh, the book is pretty predictable, and not even being a straight-up fantasy could have done that. Anything to help it. Now, the fact of the matter is, is the the final scene where you know Xander confronts the the, the villain of the book is actually pretty cool. Where he takes in you know different familiars into his body and gets powered up. But again, it, it wasn't anything that you haven't seen somewhere else. It, it just wasn't as exciting. Uh, so I don't know. I don't know what could have been done to make this different or better other than sticking with a single narrative, making some sense of certain things and giving the readers or listeners something to really sink their teeth into. As it was, it was just 11 hours of da -da 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 slice of life stuff. And I know like people like Ramon, for example, likes slice of life. I don't. I like to have 
action and I need to have an end point at somewhat, you know, some destination to get to. I need that in my stories. I don't like to have meandering. This is just how things go kind of stuff because it just, it bores me. Uh, now you can have all that as long as you have something that happens between A and Z that's significant and there's a massive uh, confrontation at the end or something that does something significant. And to me, the battle, even though it was a necessity, it didn't seem all that significant and it wasn't it wasn't unexpected how things ended or what was going to happen. It was pretty much easy to figure out. Now, Scott Bennett narrates the story, and while he does a good job, he couldn't save this. As my wife would say, it was a hot mess. Um, I often wonder why Bennett is not a bigger part of the lit RPG audiobook community. Uh, he's done a lot of lit books, but he seems to only pop up on the FB pages occasionally. You know, Facebook is there, and he, and he does zip in from time to time, but... We have uh, other narrators who've done maybe one or two lit books, and they're around a lot. And I'd like to see, you know, <coughs> excuse me, uh, Scott get in there and, and become a part of the community a bit more. I mean, he really has a lot to, uh, to, to add. And honestly, if you look at this right here, this book, there's nothing he or anyone else could have done to save it. I mean, I could have had Luke Daniels or Jeff Hayes or Annelise Rennie or... Andrea Parsno or anybody step in and the book is just going to be the book. There's just nothing you can do to elevate it. I would say a great narrator can elevate a bad book into a good book. But I think this was just a middling book. And no matter what you did with it, it was just going to be a middling book because of all the issues. Um, it was a hot mess from start to finish with inconsistencies and bland MC and predictable storytelling. Bennett is not a magician. <coughs> and I do not lay this one issue this one book on any, on his feet at all. Okay, he did everything he could to keep the ship afloat. But the book was the Titanic carrying about 20 tons of instant forming concrete mix and another 40 tons of steel girders. It was going down no matter who was at the helm. Um, it kind of started off with some hope and it went down quickly. Bennett was really like one of those brave musicians on the Titanic who continued to play as the ship sank. Uh, you know, they had nothing to do with the crash and neither did he, but they did, and he did, everything they could to make the passengers, us, the listeners, feel better. Uh, he tries to, you know, buoy your spirits, but to no avail. A sinking ship is a sinking ship, no matter what it sounds like as it submerges. So, you know, Scott, I appreciate your attempt, but it just was what it was. The book isn't as bad as some as I've reviewed, and, and I had to force myself to listen, and that's, that's my key thing. Um, when I have to listen to get done with the book, I know I'm not going to have a good time. I know it gets harder as I go because the the more I fight against it, the, the, the worse it gets. And this was one of those books where the 11 hours really felt like 22. And I probably honestly listened to it in one eight-hour stretch and then two one-and-a-half-hour-plus minutes breaks in between over a two-day period. And usually I can get through an 11-hour book in one day the way I have my work schedule set. So... I know that it was just, it was a struggle to get through. And I really hate to do this because I've actually read another book of Darren's that I enjoyed immensely. Um, and I'll review that later on this afternoon here in this, this actual podcast. Um, but it, if I'm honest, I didn't loathe the book, but neither did I like it. It was kind of like an accidental bully. Um, it beat you up without meaning to, you know, Hey, uh, poof, Oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to give you that black eye. Um, regardless of the intent, it still left me with the bruises. Um, so, in fairness, I'm giving this book really a 6 out of 10. I was thinking about a 5, but a 6, as Ramon explained to me long, long ago in a galaxy not so far away, that 6 is, I didn't enjoy the book, but you might. Okay, I really I felt there were a lot of problems, but there was a lot of potential. I think it is a, a good starter book for somebody who's not all that familiar with lit RPG, it would be a good way to break them in. It also would be, if you don't mind some beheadings and, you know, slight murder things happening, if you're okay with that with your kids, then it could be a family book too, because there's no, you know, naughty bits other than the killing. And I'm one of those people that do not believe that violence is something kids can't deal with. You know, when I was a kid, I, I played, you know, knights and, and I played, you know, cowboys and I played police officers. 
and I killed a lot of my friends every single day, and they killed me every single day, and it was as bloody as we could imagine, and I grew up not killing people at all. I just bury them. So, uh, you know, I, I just don't have a problem with that. I, I think that the book was not a complete dumpster fire. It had a scale little frame of a decent book. It was a family book, possibly. It's a good starter book for somebody who's not into lit, but if you are a big fan of lit RPG and you've been into the the whole thing for a while, this is not going to suit you. Like I say, I'm not real big into the crunchy stuff. I like that to pop up every so often. Um, I do like it, but I can go without a whole lot of crunch. I'm more of a mushy kind of, we have stats and we have this, and I leveled up. All you have to do is tell me to level it up, and I'm cool. Um, but if you're a hardcore, this is not going to be your thing because the mechanics are just, it, it, it's like they're using metric devices to work on non-metric equipment and they are foreign vehicles but we only have american parts it, it's it's just those are the mechanics i'm talking about okay that's how this book comes across it just did not work as game lit or lit rpg well i'm getting game lit i could give it that but it, it just was not a strong lit rpg book from start to finish it just had issues with the mechanics and I'll be the first one to admit, I, I have a hard time writing my own stuff with with uh, stats and things like that, because I'm horrible with math, and I, I just could not keep track of certain things. But here, it had nothing to do with math. It was just a lot of just stuff blowing up, and, I, and, and, and Bennett could not MacGyver it, is how I look at it. So, 6 out of 10, you might enjoy it. It's perfect for new people, because they won't have a clue what's wrong, and then they can learn it as they go. So, 6 out of 10. I'm sorry, Darren, but you'll get a better review when it comes to Hero Hunter in a few bit minutes here. Okay, so the next book I'm going to be reviewing is Tamer 4, King of Dinosaurs by Michael Scott Earl, narrated by Luke Daniels, with a book length of 7 hours and 28 minutes. I'm going to come down so we can talk face to face. I said to Kuwaru as I gestured down the wall of the cliff, Can you bring all of your people out so I can meet them? Hmm. She hesitated and then turned back to the carved entrance of her cave. Is that necessary? We are a private bunch, as I'm sure you and yours are. Look, Kuwaru, I just saved your ass, and I'm gonna need to know who everyone is in your tribe so that I can figure out how you all are gonna pay me back. Will Lack followed me back to my camp, and I bet he took account of all the people I had there, so I'm just asking to be on an equal footing. You are right, Victor, she said. We will all come out to meet you. I want to be friends with you, and I'm thankful that you came to help us. We'd all be dead or slaves if you had not come. Now, first of all, I have to say it's nice to get a new MSE book on Audible. Earl might not have ever vanished from Audible, but he did from Amazon. He did. He still is gone from Amazon, I think. Um, anyway, there wasn't really anything new on Audible popping up of his. He had old stuff up, but Tamer 4 is brand new. And while he may not be on, on Amazon yet, he is popping out new material on Audible, so I'm happy for that. Honestly, I've read several of Earl's series, like Destroyer and Lion's Quest, but nothing of his ever blew me away. Hell, it felt like three quarters of Lion's Quest was outside of the game. It just didn't it didn't take place where it should have. It was just bizarre how that whole thing happened. It was maybe a bunch of build up. Uh, and Destroyer was so so overhyped in my my opinion. I kept hearing, "Oh, on Destroyer, just wait till he snaps on the elves. Just wait." Uh, I did, I did, and I wasn't impressed. Uh, I I actually read the first two books of, of Destroyer. And I just was not overwhelmed by the amazingness of it that everybody told me I was going to be. Um, however, uh, just because I didn't think that this book was brilliant or that book was brilliant doesn't mean that it was bad writing. And I never hold that against, you know, writers. Sometimes they, I just don't connect to a series like other people do. And that's fine because I just feel that there are times when this is not for me and that is for you. So I tried Tamer uh, and and while it didn't blow me away, I didn't hate it, and actually I thought, I could give this a shot. And Tamer kind of clicked as we went, and I've been a fan ever since. Now, Tamer is, something I have to say, is a light lit RPG. 
It actually focuses more on world and camp building than it does leveling, stats, or character sheets. Although everyone in Dino World has a power, and there are some amazing powers, uh, but some just don't have really great powers. Victor, the main character, has a killer one. He can control dinos, and in Dinosaur Land, that gives him quite the edge. And he built up quite a literal, literal harem, and seems to add more ladies to his roster each book. So, if you don't like harem or you don't like sex, this is not a series for you. And I'm really getting to a point now where I don't know. I just reviewed, uh, you know, Daniel Shinnefin's uh, Apocalypse Gates. And I, I just reviewed, you know, a couple other books that have like a lot of sex in them. And I'm getting to a point where the sex is just so overwhelming sometimes that like Ramon says, he skips those things. I really, really want to do that, but I don't because I, to me, I'm, I'm cheating myself or the listeners of my, the podcast by saying I didn't read the entire book. And it's not a, a critique on anybody who doesn't read the entire book. I would just say it. I get where you say, I just, okay, it's just sex. And I'm going to blink right over this. Is that the right word I should use? Is it blink? I'm going to blow. No, I'm not going to blow over it. Um, I'm going to skip skip over that and go to the next scene that actually has some relevance to the story uh, because it is getting kind of old to a certain extent without some creativity or reasons why. I think that sex in a book should have a reason why it's occurring. Um, now this right here, uh, this is one of those books, like I say, that I love. It picks up right where the last left off, and we find Victor negotiating with another camp for goods. Of course, something does go off the rails after the meeting, and there is a scramble to prepare for the coming danger. Uh, these books, for Tamer at least, are kind of predictable in how they unfold. I could almost tell you exactly what's going to happen before it does. Uh, so there are things they have to deal with, like Charles' pregnancy, a flying humanoid, and an assault on the fort. In between, we have a few sex scenes, and we get to know a little bit more about the mysterious Jade. For example, for some reason, Victor seems to be able to understand her when no one else can. So MSE gives you a little information that only serves to make the reptilian replicator even more mysterious. And he does that through the entire series, with everything he does. You get this much information, and then you have that many more questions appear from what he gives you. So it's not really fair the way he deals that out or doles it out. Um, but again, this is one of those stories that doesn't really have an end in sight. It just keeps, seems to keep going in the same pattern over and over again. Uh, they just build their little fort up and he has sex. And maybe, maybe, just maybe they'll figure out what's going on. Um, I, I've always felt that MSC knows how to pace a story. I might not have loved Destroyer, but it moved right along. Here, though, the pacing is fine. It is a touch predictable. As soon as he left the other camp, I knew there was going to be a fight. Going to the waterhole has become a euphemism for going to bed with whomever he is with. Uh, there is a nice snappy drum beat to dum dum that says, uh, here's where we're going to try and improve the camp, and here's where we have a fight. It's kind of like dun 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 fight. Dun, 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 dun. Sex. Dun, 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 dun. Problem. Dun, 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 dun. Trial. Dun, 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 dun. Fight. Dun, 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 dun. Sex. That's the whole way the book goes. It's. It, I'm not complaining. I still enjoy the story, and I can't wait to see what happens next. But I sort of know what's coming, depending on the time of day, or where they're at, or what just occurred in the prior scene. There's just some things that just never, <laughs> never changes. So when they go to the water and hole, bump, bump, bu there's going to be some sex. Or, you know, if they, they go somewhere to go, there's going to be a fight. Or if they come back, it, it's going to be ugly. So there's just certain things that happen. that It has a predictability, but it doesn't bother me so much because he is advancing the story with each novel. And that is the biggest point, because if you're just treading you know, water, if you're just spinning your wheels, I don't enjoy that. The story does advance, it just does so very slowly. Um, it, but like I say, it's good writing, it's a good story, it's good characters. I love the characters and the interactions that he has with the ladies. I'm not talking about the sexual interaction. There's a lot of stuff that goes on. Now, the big issue, issue that I have is we are now four books, and it does kind of, like I say, are we treading water? I don't know. There are no massive advances that are made. We get fix-ups 
from the, the fort. We get improvements on the fort, but we don't know. Are they on a spaceship or are they on a planet? We don't know. Who are the abductors and what are they doing to people they snatched? We don't know. How much longer will people be added, new people be added to the planet or the place they're at? We don't know. These are things that haven't even been hinted at. There are no solid answers. And while the stories are fun and fast paced, they're on a treadmill to a certain extent. And like I say, it's not as bad as other books, but it's there. Um, we're handing out bits and pieces of information that come from different puzzles. And we're expected to put together this pretty picture. Uh, but you can't. You can't make an awesome picture when the puzzles don't even go together. The pieces don't go together. Uh, we just don't have all the, the, the pieces, and we don't know what we're supposed to be building. So, uh, after three books, I think we need some more answers and not more questions. Uh, a slighter issue I have is that more women tend to get added each book. And it makes it difficult to connect with the ladies. Uh, Sheila, to me, is a standout character. Uh, I have long hoped uh, that Victor would get a chance to fight her husband at some point. Uh, but now she's basically just barely mentioned. Um, in, in contrast to Trell. Uh, Trell, who somehow manages to dominate every scene that the women are in. And I don't know if it's because you know Earl loves Trell so much. But she is just the overwhelming voice of the women in the party. Um, and it, it just takes away because you can focus only on two or three women, women per book. And that's just the truth of it. The majority of that deals with them having sex with Victor. So you don't have a lot of emotional changes or connections. Uh, it's just, you know, Trell screaming about how great she is and how she wants to have babies. And, you know, the other people just kind of go along with it. Uh, it makes it hard to connect with the newbies and maintain ties to the classic guard of the camp. Uh, it, it makes me wonder just how many women becomes too many women in a harem. Yeah, I get that the village needs to grow and that everyone who is new has some ability that will make their lives easier in the camp. But in the long run, it can be overwhelming. Uh, to be honest, he added a couple of girls in the last book, and I can't even tell you the names of them. Okay, I really can't. Um, there's an alien who can make things heavier later. Can't tell you her name. The only reason why I know Jade is because I have a suspicion about Jade, about who she is, what she is. And I'm just waiting to see if she is or is not, you know, um, if she hasn't been deposed by her people and sent there. If her people are not the ones who are grabbing everybody, I don't know. I don't know, but that's a possibility. Um so the newest batches of babes are just a blur to me because there weren't just one or two as he's been doing slowly is adding in like one or two women per book. There were like six at this other camp. Um, it, it just, I couldn't even tell you who they are, or what they do. And I've just read the book. Um, there's, I know there's a red devil lady who can touch people and know what their emotional baggage is. Beyond that, I don't know her name. I, I, can't tell you a thing about her. Just putting it out there. So, you know, you're starting to overload on women. Uh, <laughs> that sounds like a bad thing. But, I mean, honestly, it is. Uh, the characters don't have time to grow or change or do much other than have sex with Victor. Or, you know, okay, Galmine's growing food. Uh, Trella's making a filter or making pottery. Uh, so on and so forth. They've just become essentially... You know, they're, they're tasks. They, they aren't characters anymore. They are just what they do to improve the camp. And then occasionally show up naked or do something to entice Victor. Still, I, I think one of the biggest standout moments for me came during Victor's big battle. This was a necessity. It was great to see him finally go toe to talon with a bloke that he wouldn't have had even considered having a possibility of fighting in book one. Uh, he would have just said nope and just took off. It was a great bloody fight that showed Victor what he was actually made of for a change and that he belonged as the leader of the team in the camp. And it was a pretty cool vi villain too. Uh, to me, that fight scene made a whole lot of that book worthwhile. And I still want to see Sheila have her husband show up and Victor fight her sans dinos. You know, now more than ever. I want to see him take this guy out, Sheila's husband, with his bare hands. Because, you know, she was like, oh, you're a big wuss. He's, he's so tough and he'll kill you. Uh, 
I want to see Sheila's husband in a battle with Victor finally come to be and see just how uh, Victor does because I know it's going to be a brilliant, brilliant fight if it ever gets there. Luke Daniels is a narration beast, and I say that in all sincerity. Now, I know I tout Jeff Hayes a lot, but I have to admit that Daniels is my second go-to guy for narration. He has a bag full of voices that are authentic and stunning. He just doesn't do women's voices as well as Jeff, but he does do one hell of a dog. If you ever listen to him do Oberon and the Iron Druid, you'll see what I mean. Uh, he does one killer Irish wolfhound impression. And I honestly believe that's how dogs would talk. Really do. Really do. Here, he completely knocks the story out of the park time and again. He lends emotion to Victor that you can only get from doing amazing voice work. And it doesn't come from the page so much as it does Daniel's heart. Now, I'll be honest with you. I, I don't think his voices, you know, for, for women really stand out. They sound like a guy trying to sound like a woman with an accent. Okay. <laughs> that's, that's just how I, I hear it. Uh, you know, whereas with like Jeff Hayes, Jeff Hayes goes into female mode and he really kills it. You can hear women in his voice. And I'm not putting down Jeff when I say that. I think it's an incredible talent and it's a skill. Uh, and I'm not even saying Daniel's is lesser for that. Uh, it just, that's the only thing I got to say is he just can't do the female voice as well as I would have hoped. If he could, he would be probably the top narrator in the field, but he, he doesn't do a whole lot of female stuff. So the book is really good, uh, but I'm starting to need a little bit more from the series. Just, just, you know, setting up camp and sex scenes and dinosaurs isn't doing it for me anymore as much as it was. Uh, it's still interesting. I'm still going to read the books. I recommend that you do. Go back, get book one, and just zip right on through to four now. Uh, it's it's really good. It's not something you you, would, you wouldn't enjoy. Um, the book and series continues to hold my attention, even if it is becoming a little bit predictable in its plot and pacing. Uh, the saving graces are it has great fight scenes, and Victor actually shows a lot of character growth in each book. Final score is 8.1. So our next book is going to be Vortina, Everybody Loves Large Chest, Volume 3, by Nevin Ilyev, narrated by Jeff Hayes, with a book length of 14 hours and 11 minutes. So I was going to sing one of two songs. Either I was going to go, Vortina, whoa, or I was going to say, Boxy's back and you're going to be in trouble. Hey, uh, hey, uh, Boxy's back. But but I decided not to do that, so we'll just skip to the blurb. Yeah. A hoarse, bleeding sound cut through the wilderness, interrupting the pair's aimless wandering. Oh no, not again, Fizzy lamented. That bleat meant two things. They were about to be attacked, and the gnome would have to be put in a safe place. The latter was why the mimic promptly wrapped the apprehensive gnome in its tongue tentacles and tossed her into storage. Much to her dismay. Meh! Another bleat, this one subtly different from the first. It was followed by two more before four humanoid figures leapt from the shadows to surround the half-spider, half-box. These monsters had the horns and hooves of a ram or goat, with the torso and arms of a human. Their entire bodies were covered in thick brown fur, with most of their mass concentrated around their powerful legs. Unsettling yellow goat eyes sized up the strange creature in their midst. Their makeshift bone-tipped spears pointed threateningly at the bizarre abomination. Well, I don't know if it's everybody's favorite, but my favorite murder box has returned for yet another installation of this amazing series of monstrous adventures. It has a few things going for it right off the bat. As I've been saying, it pretty much picks up right where the last book ended. I like that. I like that a lot. Sometimes a month later type opening works, but not here. It is really important to note that Boxy is still very, very young. In fact, that's a big issue in this novel. And in spite of his powers, it's, it's good to stay aware that he is still an infant. He's still a child. Uh, and you can't do that if you pop up a book four months down the line or, you know, six months. So staying right with where we left off at is pretty slick and pretty smart. Uh, secondly, we get right into the lich action. We don't really dawdle around and try to set the story up. 
we go right towards the Lich. It's probably within the first two chapters we get to the Lich. Um, and that's a big factor for me, too. It, it's one of those things where I worried that 90% of the book was going to be about them going to stop the Lich, get there, and then battle the Lich, and then the book was going to be over. No, 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 no. See, that's what I like when a, a, a writer like Ilyev does something that you expect to happen and, and then twist it around and says, by the way, nope, 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 that's completely not where I'm going with this at all. Ilyev knows how to write so that the, the more things change, the more they stay the same. And I don't mean that in a negative way. I mean that um, no matter what happens to Boxy, no matter how he evolves, he is still that little chest full of teeth and as brutal as ever. The truth is, every time something happened to Boxy, I nearly panicked thinking things were going to go dramatically another way and change the way that our little monster worked. And no matter what evolution Boxy went through, he still remains Boxy. Clueless, cunning, and without mercy. And that's great, because I think Ilyev realized that you don't broke what ain't fixed. Wait, how's that saying go? You understand what I'm trying to say. Um, there was just no point in retankering with his format just because Boxy has to evolve. And there was never a question, like, he has three choices of evolution when the time comes, which one he was going to pick. I knew it. You will know it. Uh, but the other ones are pretty weird uh, options, and I, I think they could have had some potential too. But he had to go this route. There was never any question about that. Now, the book has numerous battles that are fairly epic in nature. I really enjoyed the encounter with the Lich and how the murder box dealt with her. The demons are just as nasty as you remember, which means a lot of naughty fun. The only issue I have with the book is it comes down to how the mimic treats Fizzy. Fizzy's brutalization bothered me quite a bit. Because unlike the demons or the undead, she was a living creature, a living being who was basically tortured on a constant basis. And then there's this really, really horrible event that pretty much nearly made me stop listening and just step away because it was rather real. I sort of wish Ilyev had pulled a Shawshank move and just rolled away around the corner and let our imaginations kind of fill in what could have happened. But later on, it's pretty clearly spelled out that what we thought happened is exactly what happened. And as an adult, I can say this is an adult book. And I can ask myself, how can I complain about something uh, that when people are being murdered right and left and I don't blink an eye, that's fine. But this, this bothers me because contextually it fit, but I have to admit it hit me really kind of hard. So be warned, there is a really, really hard scene that hits, you know, fizzy and it really, really has an impact on her mentally and emotionally as it should have. As it should have. Now, I'll say something like this. Fostering Faust gets a lot of crap over what it does, but it didn't go to this direction at all. Didn't. Uh, and like I say, I'm an adult, and I can I can go, okay, these are fictional things, but it still bothered me. And I can say, yep, Boxy was completely obtuse and oblivious to what he was doing. But her brutalization just it, it just bothered me because it was real. It was real. <clears throat> so be warned, there are some grown-up issues taking place. And one thing that amazed me is how this somehow turned into a harem book with the Mad Box at the center of the sexcapades. And considering that Boxy is pretty much an amorphous asexual, I didn't even see that on the horizon. Really didn't did not have a thought that something like this could occur at all. But it does. Uh, Vortina is not heavy most of the time. Generally, you'll find yourself chuckling at the antics of one of the characters or situations. The book is really funny as hell, and it made me laugh multiple, multiple times. And I won't lie, I've never enjoyed the book more than when Boxy is slaughtering people. That is just the best part of the book. Ignorance is his armor, and confidence is his sword. A paragon of humility he is not, and he has no issue beating his way or killing his way through whatever stands in his path. Uh, 
once he evolves, he definitely seems to get a little bit smarter on how he goes about doing things. So, you know, Boxy has levels and layers, and that's shown with the Lich. There's a there's a scene where, you know, you get to see, like, Boxy's sense of self-worth, and it is indomitable, all right? Uh, the narration here is top of the line, and he really nails the vocals. Seriously, I think he played Fizzy so well that she became pretty real, and that was why her incident bothered me so much. There are also uh, some things in this book that just, it, it cracks me up, and there are only two books that have amazing hotline phone calls like this. One is The Afterlife by Domino Finn, and the other is this killer series. I cannot wait for the moment when Boxy calls Carl to talk things over. They, these are precious, hilarious bits that I appreciate how they're handled. Jeff has upped his game on this factor. This time around, uh, you know, just he kills this. Uh, he, he handles the, the phone call so, so beautifully. Um, and I have to also say that Jeff has also upped his emotional stakes. Uh, usually I would say, you know, when Jeff and Annie Ellicott work together, uh, Annie has a lot more emotional power to what she does compared to Jeff's crafting skills. Uh, you know, Jeff is a master narrator. Uh, but here, and I don't know if he's, you know, Annie's rubbed off on him, but he has really, really upped the emotional stakes of what he's doing. Uh, I was very surprised and impressed, um, you know, so I had to make this my, my sound booth spotlight this week just because Jeff all on his own, because remember, this is only Jeff here. He's not got, you know, Justin Thomas James or Annie or, or you know, Lori Catherine there to help him or back him up. He carries this book completely on his shoulders. And I think nobody else could do boxy without lips. Because that Jeff does that so wonderfully. It's just brilliant. And it makes me laugh every time I hear it. So, you know, Jeff, top tier narration, and it rocked me right back to 1981 when the Stray Cats release rocked this town. Because that's just what he did. He rocked this book inside out. Hayes continues to get better and better. Uh, this is one of those books that you burn through like it was soaked in gasoline. You have so much fun that you are sorry that there is not another novel lined up, so I get jealous of people who are just discovering the series, because SBT, uh, so that they can just SBT and chill as the series unfolds. Seriously, I was not planning, uh, you know, panning the events of the book, but I will say they hit you hard, so be prepared. Uh, get the latest installment of this book now, because I need my boxy to come back and eat more towns. So my final score is going to be 8.4, uh, because it, it would have been higher, but the, the devastation that is beset upon poor, poor Fizzy just really hurt me, uh, and it bothered me. It still bothers me. I'm sitting here now, and just thinking about it kind of gives me the... I don't know how to put it any other way. Um, so I had to knock some points off for that, because it, a book can disturb you and be good, but this was just disturbing in the wrong way, in the wrong place. Uh, so I'm hoping we kind of avoid that in the future. But Iliev is brilliant. Hayes is brilliant. 8.4. You won't want to miss this. Get it now and enjoy. All right. Next up, Valley of Death, Apocalypse Gates, Author's Cut, Book 2, by Daniel Shinifin, narrated by Andrea Parsnow, with a book length of 9 hours and 39 minutes. You're a cold killer, aren't you? Charlene asked. The sheer callousness of his disregard for taking other lives clearly bothered her. I am what I am. Alvin said as his body armor vanished into his duster. Be careful on the trip. Thank you for the place to sleep, Becky added before she got into the car. I don't know what to think if you two are the good guys, Charlene sighed. Alvin got into the Mustang with a chuckle and cranked the engine. He looked at her with a smirk. Who said we're the good guys? He shut the door and put the car into gear, backing out of the space. Think they'll hold it together? Becky asked as Alvin started them back to the main road. I don't really care. As long as some of them make it to Green River, I'll get more XP. That'll help you and me. And that is where my care ends. Patting his thigh as he drove, Becky nodded. That's my hero. 
So let's make no mistake about this whatsoever. One of my favorite style of games to play is survival horror. Uh, I was a Resident Evil junkie and played Dino Crisis long after I should have. Hell, I bought an entire gaming console, the Atari, just to play Aliens vs. Predator when that game first came out. I love horror, not the crappy Stephen King stuff. That's not horror. I mean, real horror. I'm talking like when John Carpenter was actually crafting films like The Thing, The Fog. Did they all start with those? I'm just trying to think, you know. But yeah, those those things, you know, Christine. No, so that doesn't start with a the. Um, those books, did I just use Christine as a Stephen King example? No, because Christine was good because Carpenter did an amazing job directing it. Okay. Um, but there was just times where he, he, he stopped, he fell out of favor and started cranking out crap. Ghost of Mars, I am looking at you. Yes. Okay. So when you hit me with a book with a horror theme, my chips are all in. I mean, I'm slipping them in because I love horror. In fact, um, you'll probably see eventually I'm going to start putting out like short horror stories and short lit RPG stories as I work on my novel because I like to do a lot of short stuff. I, I think it has a lot of power. And most of my stories will be horror stories because that's what I've written my entire life. When I sat down to write, I have a great big box of stuff. It's all horror stuff. Um, <clears throat> so horror for me is very near and dear to my heart. I, I, most of the movies I watch are quote unquote scary movies or monster movies or slasher movies because that's just who I am. Ah, so now let's get talking about Valley of Death. Valley of Death does that thing that I like a lot, where they pick up where they left off last book. I think I've said that probably three times in this episode. I just wish that the tone would have carried over as well. The book confused me on a couple of levels. Book one sets up that Alvin, the anti-hero, and he's only an anti-hero because he's a self-professed a-hole, is set on the task of creating various safe places for humanity to rebuild from, or at the very least, take a solid stance to survive from. He's fought some zombies and mutated animals and basically did what he set out to do. He started a really good settlement. He had himself a place that humanity could defend itself from. Okay, He started this settlement, and then things called the Apocalypse Gate started opening to make it even harder to survive in this world. That sounded really interesting, as we would now have more monsters for Alvin and Gothi to fight against. The truth is, the Apocalypse Gates kind of turned into a hodgepodge of genres that took away the horror elements the first book established. Suddenly there are dragons, drakes, wyverns, and fae, you know, those elves, okay? Uh, the she. That you had to deal with making the book more of a dark fantasy survival setting than it is a horror setting. Now, sure, there are still zombies and mutated animals, but Alvin literally, literally has a discussion with a set of mutated birds that he could have just fought, okay? And we also, we gloss over that zombies are becoming more intelligent using weapons and setting traps, and, you know, it was just really weird because... This is kind of like the Walking Dead TV show uh, in one way, that they pretty much overlook that the world is overrun by zombies until zombies become necessary to the plot. And then, zombies! Okay? Uh, that is what I'm talking about. You know, the, the zombies here are pretty much in the background, even though they're getting sneakier and smarter and tougher. And you know how I'm always vetching? about doing research before you write something? Okay, here's a prime example. In the book, Alvin and Gothi uh, are attacked by giant toads. It was a really cool scene. Awesome premise, awesome battle, really cool. There was a lot of stress and danger, but toads don't live in water. And these toads came from water, went into water. Yes, toads are amphibians. Yep, yep, not arguing that at all. But I was going to be a herpetologist. So, when somebody says to me in a book, I hit the snake and the snake blinked, I'm going to scream. Because snakes don't have eyelids. 
We don't have them. Their eyes are like this all the time. All the time. That's how they look. They can't close their eyes. If a snake has a light shining in his eye, he has to go, no, and put his tail here because they can't close their eyes. Snakes can't blink. Similarly, similarly, toads do not live in water. If you want to call them toads and they go in water, then they're frogs. Frogs live in water. Frogs go into water. Frogs come out of water. The only time a toad lives in water is during their amphibian stage. Okay, they go from eggs to amphibian. I mean, uh, an amphibian, but they're tadpole stage. So they're, they're eggs, they're tadpoles, they're on land. Once they're adults, these babies are land bound. They would not have gone in the water. And I don't want to hear anybody tell me that these are monsters that the writer created, and so they can do what he wants. If he wants giant mutated toads to go into water, then giant mutated toads go into water. BS. That's crappy, sloppy writing. I don't care who does it or what they, they think. That's just an out because they didn't do research or didn't think about what they were talking about. If you want to call them frogs, call them frogs. But frogs and toads are terms that are not interchangeable, not in the slightest. There are things about frogs and toads that you could get away with. For example, if he had had the toads have claws or teeth, I would have let it slide because they are mutated animals. In reality, frogs and toads don't have teeth or claws. Now I'm going to re retract that statement and state that I know for a fact that there is a frog that has claws because it lives on a mountainside where water falls and the frogs literally had to have an adaptation for claws to exist for them to cling to the side of the mountain to stay in the water. Okay, that is the only time I can think of right off the top of my head in which they have teeth or claws. Now, I'm sure there's going to be one or two little other things like that. But for the most part, if you said to me amphibians, I will tell you straight up. One of the criteria for amphibians is they have a life cycle part in the water. They have no teeth and they have no claws. That's amphibians. Reptiles have claws. Reptiles have teeth. Reptiles do not have a life cycle that begins or starts or ends in the water. Okay, they may live in water by swimming around, but they are not hatched in water. They do not grow up or change in water. So these are the things that popped me right out of the book. And it did. It took me right out. They were having this great battle. And I was just like, ugh, I can't understand why that happens. Because it's a simple three-second thing. And maybe I'm really picky about stuff. But if I'm being honest with you, if I get ejected from a book, if somebody pulls the ejector seat, I'm not happy. I'm not happy. And I try to always like put this out there so that the writers who write these books, if they happen to watch this, I don't know if Daniel Shinefin's ever watched an episode of the show. It doesn't matter. I put it out there. If he does, then he hears me saying, you know, do a little bit of research when it comes to this. And I would be happy. I would be cool because I'm sure I'm not the only person in the world who feels this way. Okay. If you're talking about cars and somebody says that this is a V6 over this, and it's not, you're going to go nuts. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. I don't know the first thing about cars. I can tell you they come in different colors and they have different makers. There's Ford and Chevy and Subaru. I can tell you that. I can't tell you a damn thing about anything else in a car. Nothing. I don't know if there's a fan belt or if there's an engine belt. I don't know because I'm not a mechanic. I've never had an interest in that. But I will guarantee you this. If I'm talking about them working on a car, I'm going to research it and sound like I know what the hell I'm talking about. Because I'm not going to short my listeners or my readers because of my inadequacies to knowledge. I will always research something. Always. Look at the short story I wrote for uh, the anthology I'm in. I researched arachnids. I, I love arachnids. Entomology and arachnids. Those things are things that I cherish. Like I said, I used to love animals and insects when I was a kid. I was an expert on them. I really, really studied the arachnid anatomy, so that I knew what the hell I was talking about and didn't just make things up. It wouldn't be fair to you if I did. Just wouldn't. So I have to say, it's stuff like that that just pulls me right out of a story and it makes me upset when it happens. Now, another issue that I have is that in spite of upping his charisma, which was supposed to make his life easier in the first book, Alvin still seems to run into jerks that don't trust him which I don't understand that because if he's got a good enough charisma now, they should at least say, we'll give this cat a chance or we'll believe him a little bit. Or they try to kill him. <clears throat> and every single potential settlement he goes to, there is somebody who just 
doesn't have faith in him or they want to whack him or both. Sadly, this is my biggest beef, is that there are massive changes that happen at the end of the, the, the first book. Okay, I'm sorry, there are massive changes that happen at the end of this book that negates everything that happened in the first book. It makes no sense to me. This is my big, big, big beef. Okay, um, it's like Shinifin got tired of the outline he had had for the series and just decided to scrap it and make it something more suited to what he wanted now, which is fine which is fine if you don't alter everything that happened before. You don't change horses midstream, you don't rewrite code while you're playing a game, and you don't shift the plot for no discernible reasons. Readers need to know what's going on. Granted, as I listened to this book, I kept saying to myself, it felt like he was just spinning his tires. Shinifin was trying, but he wasn't going anywhere. It was a try to start a settlement, have sex with Gothi, kill something, have sex with Gothi, try to start a settlement type book. That was the pattern it went. I could see even that the gates were open. It was just a new kind of a monster adventure. It, it didn't really do much of anything. Uh, the only thing I really have to say that I love, love, love about the book is Alvin and Gothi's relationship. It's very healthy. Uh, it's supportive. And it shows two people can be adults and not fight all the time. There is no struggle in their relationship. It almost sounds or seems or feels effortless. And that's refreshing. Okay? Not every every book has characters like this. The two mesh really well. And they show their support from one another. Top to bottom. No matter what names they call each other. No matter how they refer to each other. They each have each other's back 100% all the time. And even in their darkest moment, when it's terrifying and they are alone, they trust the other person. And that's a big, big thing. This is the book's shining achievement. And it gets a little undercut with the constant sex. Now, I'm not a prude. I don't have an issue with sex. I enjoy sex on TV, in movies, in books. Um, you know, I, I like Game of Thrones, and I don't complain whenever, you know, they start having sex. Uh, but I would have preferred preferred more of a few tender moments over four or five of the sex scenes. Uh, sex scenes you can skip. I know Ramon says he does that uh, a lot of times in books. And I don't do that. I don't skip sex scenes because I, I feel like I'm shorting you as the listener here by not actually reading the whole book. And, and I agree, it's, there's nothing happening in those sex scenes that is relevant or dire to the story unless you know they have to bone really hard to save the settlement for some reason that would be like a key factor that you just couldn't skip that part um here that's not the case um so i uh, i'm more about having emotional scenes or character growth scenes and and the the reason being is is you have par snow doing the narration par snow adds a hell of a lot more than just boning when she reads. Her emotional power is so overwhelming, okay? It, it just, it's what keeps you there. Um, especially towards the end of the book. I mean, you know, it was just sex, 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 sex. The sex scenes popped up like daisies out of the snow. I really could have listened to Andrea give some more warmth and, and tenderness between these two people rather than, you know, a diatribe about what they were doing to each other. As for Andrea herself, Parsnow is what keeps this book on an even course. She fuels it with emotion and can read an action scene far better than Michael Bay can direct one. Yeah, I mean, not that that's hard to do because I could probably direct a better action scene than Michael Bay. He just blows stuff up. But that's not taking away from Andrea at all. I mean, she's an incredible narrator, and I know that I often come across as an unabashed fanboy. But Andrea really knows her craft and can tell one hell of a story. I doubt I would have enjoyed this book as much if she hadn't been given the reins. It is her portrayal of Gothy that resonates with the listener and rings so true she makes you believe that Gothy is real. Gothy is the real star of the show. You can say Alvin is the hero, Alvin is the main character. He has nothing on Gothy. Gothy is what brings you in and keeps you there. If Gothy did not exist, I would probably not enjoy the book half as much. Really would not. That's a fact. Uh, Gothy is outstanding and sharing is caring. You know, uh, that's it. That is where it all comes from. 
they they have this bond, and it's because of Gothi more than Alvin. Alvin is a sociopath, in my opinion, uh, but he's made a connection that's very rare. But sociopaths are very hard to enjoy reading or listening to. Uh, I can think of you know Brock Deskin's uh, The Miscreant. That the the character of that book is a total sociopath, and he was fun to read, but he didn't have somebody like Gothi to balance him out, and so, you know. This makes that sort of superior because Gothi stands out more than anybody else in the book. Every other character is but a shadow to her. So, the book, it really, really lacks a solid direction. Um, and did nothing here to, to advance the story. In fact, it, it kind of deconstructed what happened before. So I wasn't happy with the changes that were implemented. They seem to be arbitrary. And by that, I'm talking about the entire settlement issue. I just don't see why that was redone, and it negated whatever happened with Alvin in the first book. I still enjoyed the book. I just don't see progression. And I need to see that there is a point to what we are doing. I don't have that. You know, I can play a long game. I can say, yep, we're great. We're going to go, and we're going to do this. But it's going to happen four or five books down the road. Fantastic. Fantastic. Just clue me into that. And I'm going to be with you. I will back you up. I will defend you. I will do whatever I can to help you through this. But I don't see, excuse me, I don't see Shinifin saying, here's where we're headed. To me, there's no direction here. It's just Alvin and Gothi are going to go out and drive around. And that's pretty much how the book started out. Well, where are we going to go? We'll just drive here because they know somebody in this town. So we'll just make our way there and see what we can do. It was just a rambling, rambling mess from the character's point of view. Um, it just went nowhere really fast. And I really hope that book three does a course correction and gets back on track. But right now, I'm going to give this book 7.7 .7 stars. It's not bad, but it really, it's, it's kind of dropped off from where it started. I, I think that you need to realize that, like, Cabin in the Woods, great story, great movie. Dozens of monsters in that book, or I'm sorry, in that movie, that could have been used in the Apocalypse Gates. Open it up and wraiths come out. Uh, open it up and, you know, Hellraiser type people come out. Open it up and demons come out. Open it up and you know, whatever. You, you really have unlimited numbers of monsters that are horror related that would really boost the story. You know, vampires, werewolves, animated you know, living dolls, anything along those lines would really help amp up the horror factor. Fantasy stuff just did not make it a, a horror book. And I really wanted this to remain in that field, that genre. I like horror a lot. And the fantasy stuff just kind of shoved that aside. Next time around, I really like to see, you know, more scary monster type things come into it. I think it would only improve the series, only improve the book, uh, and, and we get it back to where it started. I, I just don't like the, the digression that we've had so far from that, that field. So 7.7 .7 stars. Sorry, but that's the way I feel about it. Finally, we come to Hero Hunter, a superhero game-lit saga, Heroes Rising Book 1 by Darren Haltberg Jr. Again, narrated by Scott Bennett, again, with a book length of 5 hours and 53 minutes. Sir, you really should slow down. Vela's cybernetic voice chimes in my ear as I pour on the gas, forcing my bike to roar across the cracked pavement of the Undercity. Rows of massive steel archways zip past my vision on either side, foundations used to hold up the corporate monoliths in the city above. I lean hard to the left, nearly touching the ground as I whip the cycle around a tight corner before exploding down the street, leaving a cloud of exhaust in my wake. How close are we to the contact point? I ask as the wheels of my bike hit the ramp, taking us to the city's upper levels. Pyramite was just spotted thwarting a bank robbery about two miles up ahead. We should be arriving on scene in a matter of moments. Good. I respond as I crouch forward on my bike. Pyromite was a Class B hero, 
a ranged fighter with the ability to both create and manipulate fire. He was also the next target on my list. Okay, so I don't think I've ever done this before where I review two books by the same author on the same show with the same narrator as well. Uh, so this time, I think I'm going to go a little backwards and start with the narration. Uh, J. Scott Bennett has long been one of my audible go-tos. He narrates amazing stories. Uh, he, I'm sorry, he narrates an amazing story called Brother Bones. It's not lit RPG, but it's an incredible pulp noir paranormal tale that'll knock your socks off. So don't listen to it in your bare feet or it'll get really messy. As I generally say with Bennett, you get a solid all-around performance. Uh, the man knows his craft and I really enjoy listening to him. He treats the material right and you get an enjoyable story guaranteed from him every time. Uh, I said before, there have been several books that he picked those up when they shouldn't have been carried. Uh, so I give this man a lot of credit. Uh, here he, he does an excellent, outstanding job. Uh, I really enjoy J. Scott Bennett uh, as a narrator. I've, I've known him since I've started listening to narrations. Like I say, Brother Bones is where I know him from. Uh, and I really recommend you going out and checking that out. Even if it's not lit, you know, it's still a great series. It's fun and it's different and it's new. It's written by a guy that writes comic books. So, you know... If you like pulp or noir or horror, that's your book. Uh, here, like I say, he, he does a solid, solid performance, and I couldn't ask for more. Uh, I enjoyed the book all the way around, so he handled this as best you possibly could. Now, unlike Slayer, Hero Hunter is fairly consistent as it goes. It is a light lit RPG book, but it does have, like, you know, certain things such as stats and HUDs and character sheets. Uh, the powers are all very clearly defined as are the hero villain class levels from C to S. Uh, I never understand why we do that. We're, you know, A, B, C I can get, but making things in S something, I just, that's, I don't know where that came from. Somebody tell me because I know like Dakota Kraut and a couple other people do that with like their, their, their stuff. Like, you know, S ranking is, is awesome. And, you know, so, Someone tell me where that comes from because it goes C B A S. There's a lot of letters in between there that I just don't know where they come from or why they're lost. So if you want to help me out, you know, help help a guy out here to figure out what's going on because I just don't know why it's it's set up that way. Um, but it was nice because he gives you all the information at the end of the book instead of trying to cram it all right down your throat as you're going and taking you out of the story. He gives you everything at the end of the book. So if you want to listen to it and get a little crunchier as you go, you can do that. Uh, if you don't, you don't have to. Again, I always listen. I always go through all the books and listen to every scene and every scrap because it's not fair for me to review a book that I haven't listened to completely. Uh, but I really, if I had a choice, if it was just me, I would have skipped that because it was, it was explained well enough in the story itself as it went. I didn't see any fluctuations or 180 degree changes that I did in Slayer. The characters are well enveloped and thought out. I also think that the supers all had cool names. Generally in superhero novels, uh, you get some really dopey and not dope names. Like here you get Valor and Nightfall and Dragon and Hero Hunter. These names all work. I, I think, I don't think there was ever, you know, uh, bad hero or villain name in the book, which is a rarity because I think a lot of times um, people who write superhero things, now you don't know me very well, but I have a comic book collection that I've had since starting in 1970 and I have got more comic books than probably any three comic book shops combined you would know. Probably way more than that. I've got rooms that are dedicated to just my comic books. So I know a little bit about the superhero genre. Uh, and usually naming is the biggest issue you have with superheroes. Here, that's not the case. I really think that, that you know, Altberg knew how to classify and categorize and name his villains and heroes. Because they all worked. Nightfall was a really neat character uh, and she had a really cool name now did i feel her name matched her powers i don't know uh, you know honestly it didn't matter she was just a cool character so batman doesn't you know not everybody has to be batman where they wear a suit look like a bat and they they scare people like a bat 
no, Nightfall can just be about the darkness that she carries with her. And that fit. That fits solidly. Um, Hero Hunter, on the other hand, his powers are a little weird. And I'm not saying that negatively. Um, but he's a tech mage. So, but he's not like a really overwhelming tech mage. Uh, and that's where I kind of get, get, get the weird stuff. Um, because he uses a lot of technology which is just basically this gun or that gun or whatever. Uh, so he's more of a weapons specialist than he is a techno mage throughout most of the book. Uh, there are two big scenes where he actually uses his techno powers to their utmost, and those were really cool, outstanding, neat scenes. And I enjoyed those especially well. Um, <coughs> so, like I say, I think all the supers, you know, had cool names, and the only name that felt forced was Hero Hunter's superhero id which was tech imperious uh imperious tech flows much better to me but then i've always been a namor fan and imperious rex just rolls off the tongue uh, i don't know if you ever watched the old namor cartoon but imperious rex and and that was it so imperious tech would have been just a little bit better in my opinion uh, you know mr Haltberg. however tech imperious is fine i understand it and i get it and it still works so that's one of my big uh, hurdles for superheroes is the naming aspect. And he, he skirts right through that. No problem. The story is pretty simple, which is a benefit. A benefit. Hero Hunter is wronged, begin killing, begins killing heroes in retaliation of what was done to him and his friends. The only flaw that I saw in this whole book was the characterization was that if Hero Hunter started out on the side of angels... Uh, then why would he begin killing innocent heroes afterwards? He's a good and decent guy, so he wouldn't be greasing everybody he encountered just because of some of the things that the big names in Hero Land did. Yeah, you know, it might have been horrifying, but that doesn't mean you know you go out and you just start whacking everybody willy nilly. Um, otherwise, the story kind of goes off the rails, and, and and that's what he does here. Um, and I always go back to the Punisher. Uh, the Punisher is Hero Hunter, but with different modifications. Punisher gets wronged, and he gets out and seeks vengeance. However, he does not go around blowing away police officers or feds. He only kills the bad guys. Here, Hero Hunter just kills anybody who wears a cape and says they're a good guy. Uh, it just doesn't make sense to me to a certain extent, because if he was a really good person to start with, then he would focus his revenge on those that he felt were responsible for what happened to him and his friends. Uh, he doesn't do that. He, he, he pretty much just says to hell with it. I'm going to start greasing everybody I know who's a good guy. Superheroes, they got to go. Got to go, got to go, got to go right now. And so that's what he does. It, it, it just was kind of a little weird how that happened. I just didn't see that being a character possibility. Unless he's a sociopath. And if he's a sociopath, then he's not really a hero in the first place. So that that was like my big problem. Otherwise, the story is decent. It has really cool fight scenes. Uh, the runtime works really well, too. Uh, the story is not overly long. You know, five hours and you know 50 minutes. Uh, it fits pretty well for the time that we are given. I find that I am liking more and more my books to be five to eight hours in length. Uh, anything after that, <clears throat> unless it's an exceptionally well-written book, I tend to think that it just gets to be overblown and there are meandering points to a story. Now, there are stories like Barrow King and, you know, Returnus and, you know, uh, Life Reset that can go on. You know, Life Reset is one of those almost a full day's worth of listening if you, you sat down and didn't go to sleep or do anything other than listen. Uh, so I can, I can let that one slide. But I think most times my, my enjoyment comes from eight hours or better, you know, below that. Because it's a good, solid, this is a quick story, it's told well, and it doesn't have all the extraneous things. If you remember when I talked about Secret of the Old Ones, one of the best things about that book was it had trimmed away all of the fat. All of it. It was all gone. And, you know, here it's the same thing. You know, Holtberg does not add in tons of things. Like, you don't get perspectives from the police officers or from the government or from, you know, even from the people on the street. Other books, you would have had all three of those things. Like, you know, 
Mary Jo was walking down the street when the building collapsed and, you know, Imperious Tech came by and grabbed her and, and ran her away. That would have happened. Or, you know, the, the police officers were bound and determined to catch Hero Hunter. That was not there. And that's because he trimmed that book down to a manageable size that worked. Anything else, and it would have kind of just bleh, been like a, an egg splattered on the floor, spreading out. It, it would have been a great, solid, perfect thing, but the moment you let it get bigger, the messier it got. Uh, it just would have fractured. So, you know, <clears throat> if you look at that book, The Slayer, the runtime there, I think, had a lot to do with the issues that it had because there was just so much going on that just blew, just spun around. Um, so if this had been a bigger book, it would have gone wrong. Here, the writing is tight and succinct. So again, I'm going to say it is superior to Slayer once more on that aspect of things. The play, This played out as action in almost every scene rather in points of exposition in every scene. You don't have dialogue that runs for 10 pages. You have a lot of things happening one after another. It's a domino effect. This happens, this happens, this happens, this happens, this happens, this happens, this happens done. And that's the way it should work for all books. He just keeps it real nice and tight. Now, as I say, the characters are far more interesting here and have real motivations. If I compare Xander... Uh, from Slayer to Hero Hunter, then the Hunter has real reasons for doing everything he does, risking his life, okay? Aiden, the Hunter, has suffered real loss, undergone betrayal of the highest magnitude, and seeks actual revenge. He is motivated and has reasons for every risk he takes. Xander doesn't have that, okay? The only goal that Xander really has is he's trying to get back home. But to risk your life for something that was ethereal, because I'll would, i be like, I'll just put it out there because I'm not reviewing that book right at the moment, but I'll be honest with you. Um, the moment they said we can get you back home, my bs meter went off. I, as a person, would have said, you're so full of crap, I don't want to hear it, okay? That was just one of those things where the motivation was washed out to start with. It had no value. It was just meh. So... That really hurt the book in itself. Here, there's a real reason for everything that Aiden or Hero Hunter does. Uh, this book feels more like the I have learned from my issues in the first book kind of sequel. You know, it's not a sequel to Slayer, but it's a follow-up. He wrote Slayer first. I can almost guarantee that. I can feel that in my bones. Whether it came out first or second out of the two, I don't know. But I can tell you Slayer is more likely his first book or his first release book and hero hunter is where he has benefited from what happened with slayer and improved upon what he's done um one of the best thing about this novel hero hunter is that it actually wraps up every single problem presented to the main character by the end of the book and it sets up a potential for a sequel without having well it does sort of at the end negate what happened a little bit with that, but you have to have, you know, Doctor Doom just doesn't get burned up in, in the asteroid fall, or you know, uh, Mole Man. I'm saying that because I'm wearing my Fantastic Four tie today. The Mole Man doesn't get crushed under tons of rubble and not show up later on. So maybe there's a, a villain who maybe just might maybe be coming back somewhere in some way or form somehow. I don't know. Uh, I won't spurl it for you, as they say in my area of the woods. But uh, it does wrap up a lot of the stuff. It wraps up a heck of a lot. And it, and it does so in a nice, neat package. The only thing, you know, that I don't know is, should Aiden be the hero hunter anymore or the hero helper from this point? Um, because it's hard to tell if he's a sociopath, because he does kill people so willy-nilly or if he's just kind of fallen into a pit that he couldn't fall, uh, kind of climb out of. Now, one of the big issues that I do have with the finale is the final fate of Valor. Valor is the one hero that Hero Hunter has his sights on from the beginning of the book. You know, why are you killing me? Because Valor. That's why. 
And I felt a little cheated, a little robbed, a, a little bit I don't know, mismanaged by how Valor was taken from the story. Uh, because to me, it shouldn't have been the person handling things that handled things. It should have been Hero Hunter. It should have been Aiden. Uh, that was, after all, his main motivation and goal in the entire book was to handle Valor by himself. And it was kind of like watching uh, a vulture you know, down there eating his meal and then a lion come running out of nowhere and running off with the, the gazelle that was you know half eaten already. Uh, I should use hyenas. Hyenas do that more than lions do. Lions are lazy. Lions do take kills off other animals, but, but hyenas really are the ones who do that. So either way, there were certain points that uh, the book didn't hit every cylinder for me it, or overwhelm me. So for those things, those reasons, like what he did with the space station, okay? What he did with the space station should have had a massive impact on society, on people. It, it should have been much bigger and devastating than what it was, all right? Uh, if you think about it, if something comes hurtling from space, there are things that happen once it goes to Earth. Just look it up. Like I say all the time, research, research, research. Okay, so because of a couple of those things I just said, um, I'm giving this 7.7 .7 stars out of 10. Uh, I think it could have been better if it had just kind of tinkered with a little bit of things that happened. Like I said, a little, little research, uh, give Aiden his time with Valor, uh, figure out whether he's really a good guy or a bad guy, don't leave us hanging. Those sorts of things or what took away from my higher score. But this is this is such a turnaround, such a turnaround from the Slayer. I mean, honestly, uh, I, I, I had to ask if it was the same person writing the book. I really did. Uh, I, I just kind of had to step back and say, what changed from Slayer to Hero Hunter? Because the dichotomy is so great. I mean, Slayer is, I don't want to call it a dumpster fire, but it's a hot mess. It's, a, it's My wife likes to say it, that is her favorite term to go to. A hot mess, hot mess. This, that was, a, that was a hot mess. This book is so much more finely tuned and crafted than Slayer. I just don't know what you did, Altberg, but you did something really well. And I hope that if you go back and do more stuff with Slayer, you listen to what, and I, I know it just can't be me. I know other people have got to have said something along the same lines, especially with the game mechanics. And, I, and maybe I'll go and look and see what reviews say about this afterwards. Because I never know, because I don't like to look at reviews until after, maybe after I'm done recording this. Uh, I generally don't do that because I like to just give my own personal opinion about things. Uh, but I'm going to bet money that there's going to be people that say the mechanics were so wonky. The, the characters were just meh and this and that so slayer had problems this book course corrects so wonderfully uh and i'm really impressed with how you did that i don't know what you did to make such a change so quickly but kudos because i really look forward to the next hero hunter 7.7 .7 stars thank you well thank you so much for watching everyone i do appreciate you taking the time to watch or listen to the show if you want to support us you can like the Lit RPG Podcast Facebook page or go to the YouTube page or just share and like the video. Uh, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or YouTube. As always, I'm going to ask to please, please, please leave comments below. Give me suggestions. Uh, say what I'm doing right or wrong so that way I can kind of improve as we go. Uh, one thing I am going to do starting next week, I think, is I was going to do a big special on is it Lit RPG or could it be considered Lit? And I'm not going to do a special. I think what I'll do is um, at the end of the show, I'll do, you know, my standard. These are the lit RPGs. I'll say this book came to me, was recommended, and people say it's a lot like lit RPG. What do you think? And I'll tell you what I think about it, about it, how I feel about it. And we'll go from there. And that way you can kind of get, you know, a feel for 
you know, there are other books out there that are pretty close to lit RPG, even if it's not exactly lit. Uh, I might even do something where game lit, where I say this this book comes from a game series. Uh, you know, like say say Dungeons and Dragons. Here's a book from Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, there's no insert by game lit. You know, it's not characters from the real world going into the game world. Uh, but I think you're missing out if you don't read this or listen to it. And I might just start doing that every so often just to throw that in there. And I'm not going to take away, I'm like, like for example, I won't cut out, you know, one review from lit RPG. I'll do my standard three or four lit RPG reviews and then give you that as an, uh, an additional thing as a gift from me to you. Okay, so for the Lit RPG Audiobook Podcast, I am always your humble reviewer, Ray, and please keep listening.